Hello again. If someone had read that 22% of patients with ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, recovered with a course of cognitive behaviour therapy, CBT, what would they think about the nature of the illness? If you met some of the patients who had recovered, average age 39, what would you expect to see? Coming off welfare benefits? A return to work, part-time or full-time? Well, no, in fact, that deteriorated a little. Perhaps you would settle for them being able to get about more. Well, again, no. You may have seen our first video showing that CBT didn't bring about any improvement in walking capabilities. Performance was still very, very low. Clearly, having 22% of recovered patients in the group made little difference to the very poor results. So if there was no objective evidence to support the claims of recovery, what did it mean? To understand this properly, let us look at the questionnaires they used to assess improvement. It's a bit tedious, but if all those medical professionals who fell for the claims had found time to examine what the different scores represented, they would have realised how poor it all was. Instead, they trusted the peer review process and that the professional journals had already checked it all out properly. They can't have. So please bear with me while I explain. Here's Jo. Her MECFS is of the more moderate type. The specialist, using the Oxford criteria, confirms that she has CFS. Then two main questionnaires. One asking patients how severely they rate their fatigue and the other asking how limited they think they are when it comes to physical activities like walking. The fatigue scale has 11 questions, and Joe has to say whether, since having ME, each item is the same as it was before, more of a problem, or much more of a problem. Here are her answers. Tiredness is clearly worse, as is the need for more rest, although she isn't any more sleepy than usual. Lack of energy is a massive problem, but starting things, muscle strength and feeling weak are no different. She has a lot more difficulty with concentration and often struggles to find the right word without actually making any slips of the tongue. Her memory, particularly short term, is giving her problems. She has problems with six areas out of 11 and that is called her bimodal score. Scores of six or more are needed to join the trial, so that's fine. Now let's look at the 10 SF36 questions for physical activities. Again, she has to say if the item gives her no problem, if she is limited a little or limited a lot. Here are her answers. Vigorous activities like playing a game of tennis are out of the question, but vacuuming is okay in short, gentle patches. She doesn't have a problem actually lifting or carrying groceries, but really struggles with anything more than going up one flight of stairs. Again, her muscles don't give her any problems with bending or kneeling, and as long as she ambles along gently, she can manage to walk a mile. Walking a few hundred yards is okay, as is bathing or dressing. You will notice that her score goes up in fives, to make the total out of a hundred which does make it look as though there is a lot more to it than just 10 questions. Jo has scored 65. At first, the PACE team only wanted to take patients who had scored 60 or less, but that didn't give them enough patients, so they decided to include those who scored 65. On page 3 of their recovery paper, they described this as an abnormal level of physical function. Remember that. Joe is in. Clearly, Joe has been hit quite hard by this illness, and there would have been a reasonable number of patients similar to her. But there would also have been many others much more severely affected, and the ones who were the most affected would not even have been able to attend the centres to be considered for the trial. All of the patients have several sessions with a specialist. The specialist explains more about the illness and is able to prescribe medication for pain, sleep and mood disorders, where appropriate. 
You will probably be surprised to hear that many GPs are reluctant to do this. Jo found that the aches and strange nerve pains in her legs gave her a very poor night's sleep, so getting some decent pain medication to sort that out is brilliant. A year later, she has to complete more questionnaires. Thanks to the pain medication, she's able to say that she feels much better. It hasn't actually made any change in her energy levels or anything like that, but it is brilliant to get a good night's sleep. That is the first step towards the recovery badge. She fills in the SF36 questionnaire pretty much as before. But now walking a mile is a lot more difficult than before, which brings a score down to 60. So let us look at the scale. A typical healthy 39-year-old would score 100. In fact, the vast majority of healthy adults of working age would score 95 or 100. Joe, starting with a score of 65, then getting a little worse, ends with a score of 60. Remember that on page 3 of the recovery paper, they described these scores as abnormal function. Before they started the trial, they said that they would set the recovery level at scores of 85 or more. Now where do you think they actually set the level for recovery, for being within a normal range? They explained this on page 3, just before the part where they reminded us that scores of 65 or less were abnormal. No, not that high. No, still too high. Keep going. Keep going. Yes. That's it. 60. Below the entry level. Below the abnormal level. Can you believe that? Can you even begin to understand how it got through the peer review process? Joe is actually a little worse, but is now within normal range. And that's the next step towards recovery. In fact, thanks to a Freedom of Information request, we now know that 81 patients, that's 13% of the whole group, started off, like Joe, with scores of 60 or 65. So these 81 patients started with scores that were described as representing abnormal levels of physical function, and yet now these same scores are counted as being within normal range. Now let's look at Joe's fatigue questionnaire. Again, her answers are pretty much the same. But she has noticed that now after she was getting a better night's sleep, she wasn't having any difficulty finding the right words anymore. That reduces her score to five items that are causing her difficulty. When it came to defining being within normal function for fatigue, the authors of the PACE trial did the same thing. Normal function overlapped the entry level. It overlapped abnormal function, just as it did for the SF36 scores. But as they also change the scoring system, it would be too messy to explain it here. But this now puts Joe within their idea of a normal range for fatigue. Look at her answers. What do you think? Is this normal for a 39-year-old? But it is the next stage towards getting the recovery badge. Now for the last and sneaky stage. To join the trial, patients had to score six items or more on the fatigue scale and 65 or less on the physical functioning scale. Patients now only had to break one of these for the authors to claim that they no longer met criteria for CFS. Because her fatigue score is now five, Cho no longer meets their criteria for CFS, even though her other score deteriorated. So that completes the last stage in getting the recovery badge. Here are her answers to both the key questionnaires. Does that look like a recovery? Remember that it was simply that in being given painkillers to help sleep at night, Jo no longer had difficulty in finding the right word at times. Is that a cure for an ME CFS? I don't think so. What about the 251 patients diagnosed with CFS at the start of the trial, 
but turned down because their scores were not abnormal enough. Are they now magically cured because their scores are above this strange new normality? When they were looking for grants for this trial, the authors set much higher targets and confidently predicted that 60% of those having CBT would reach scores of 75 or more on the SF36 scale. We have no idea whether any patients reached the original target of 85, only that 22% managed to reach the very low standards required to get the recovery badge. An honest statement would have been that all that extra CBT made no difference whatsoever to what patients could actually manage. But, after being nagged continuously about focusing too much on their symptoms, some patients did modify how badly they rated their symptoms. The problem is, of course, that this encourages expectations that CBT will lead to recovery, and, going against all the evidence, encourages the assumption that MECFS is largely psychological. In the UK, it is still the only officially recommended treatment as a result of these and similar misleading claims. So when, in a discussion in the UK Parliament in the House of Lords, a doctor, a psychiatrist, told us that patients with cancer, Parkinson's disease or MS would be grateful to have such recovery rates, do you think that person had actually looked at the details or had that person simply read the summaries and assumed that others had done the check-in? What would happen to any doctor, even a very eminent one, who announced to a cancer patient that he had recovered because he had perhaps scored a little differently on a couple of questionnaires? Even though the lab tests showed no such improvement. How would the medical profession have responded to that? Would they be singing the doctor's praises? Putting them forward for awards? No chance. And yet the PACE team did exactly that for patients with ME. They counted patients as recovered on the basis of a slight change to answers on questionnaires. Some recovery. In MS, Parkinson's disease and cancer, the most a doctor will claim is remission. How dare they use the term recovery for minor subjective variations in an illness that the government officially recognises as fluctuating? What I want to know is what gives them the right to treat those with ME with such little respect.